We're going to start this puppy up. Clear? Prop? Is we're going to remove the cover to the rotary valve and we're also going to take the electronics off. Uh, the reason I say both is they pretty much all have to come off at the same time. There are four bolts around the rotary valve cover and the top two hold the bottom of this plate that that all the electronics rest on or all your coil boxes rest on and again these are the four bolts that i was talking about uh, and then there's two more allen allen cap screws at the top that we have to take off to get this plate off uh, and you see your wires wrap around the, the oil injector uh, so, you know, it all kind of has to come off together. When you have four bolts on a circle here, you, of course, want to remove them opposite caddy corner of each other. This cross shaft bottle is... All this is is the oil that lubricates the center section and the cross shaft. That's its whole purpose in life. It doesn't get consumed. Uh, it doesn't, you know, go away. Remember I said I thought this could have been the original oil that was in it from the factory. Uh, my only guess was because of the color of the oil. Uh, again, once it's full, it just stays full unless you're leaking somewhere. Uh, and all that's required to, to refill that is, again, just your regular engine oil. Uh, all that that is for is to lubricate that cross shaft, the bearings and the, the gear that's in there and the, the seals that are in there. Because see, there are seals on each side of the cross shaft to keep that oil from running out into each individual crankcase. Again, like we talked about with the 503, this is actually two engines in one crankcase. We just want to lift this off. And right here, this hose is going to be slightly in our way, so we want to hold that down. And at this point, we need to disconnect all of the wires going to our black boxes. Uh, that's these plugs. You don't want to pull them by the wires. That's the quickest way to run a real expensive electronic system uh, or ignition system. You hold it by the plugs. They're serrated. So they give you something to grip. You twist them a little bit and pull them apart. Okay, they're polarized, so you can't hook them up backwards. Uh, these two, as you see, barely will meet. The other one is way up here. Uh, so it's going to have a real long wire on it, taking it all the way over to here. So it's very difficult to, to put them plug them into the wrong ones. Okay, and this is this is uh, the power sending coil uh, to the four main ignition generators to the black boxes is these plugs here. This plug here, this blue and yellow wire, is going to the trigger coil. Uh, that, tri that tells it when to fire. And this one line returning 
uh, which we're going to have to disconnect from the plug, is a kill wire. Okay, there are a couple of yellow wires here. They come out of here. Uh, they're your auxiliary power or your AC lighting coils. Uh, we need to take this little spiral wrap off. What we have to do next, uh, I'm not real happy. I'm happy with the new plugs that they're using. I'm not real happy with the way they wire them. These two are the kill switch wires, which has to come off with this part here. This is a tack wire, which goes into all the wiring behind here. And these two wires go into there, which is for your lighting coil uh, generators, which are behind there. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you how to take them apart. If you look inside, which is going to be very difficult to catch on camera, but you will see a four-sided metal section, and of course that's where the the spade connector goes in and then you're going to see a little plastic clip okay so what we're going to do is we're going to put it behind there we're going to pry it away and as we're prying it away we're going to pull on that wire and it comes out the rest of these we can leave all attached it won't go through yet, so we'll give it a minute. Once it comes out, this will readily, easily go through. With a little work. Okay, now we have the other kill wire that's loose also. After we get our electronic plate off, uh, then, of course, we pull the rotary valve cover off and lay it to the side. And you want to watch, this is the rotary valve plate. It will, in a lot of cases, come off because it's coated with oil on both sides. And if it's kind of stuck to this surface here, it'll come off when I pull this off. Uh, if not, it'll stay on there like it did. Uh, don't be all alarmed at the different different colorings, different shadings in there. While we're in this position, let's take a couple of minutes and try to make sure people learn to identify a blue head from a silver head. And that may sound stupid, but a few years ago we had a kind of a scam going on around here uh, where people were taking old silverhead engines and painting them blue and uh, selling them as blue heads and uh, you know new blue heads at that and if the engine was clean enough and uh, it, it got stopped pretty quick. I think people caught on pretty quick. Well, just the big thing I want to show you is there is a difference in the heads. Uh, number one, these two mounting studs are not on a silver head. Uh, it mounted to these two screws right here. With these two screws right here. And this protrusion was not as long. And the big thing was the top of the head was flat. This or the casting for it were not there. It was just a flat head. So if you have two outlets right here close together, you have a true blue head. The purpose of these two, this one has a rubber hose that goes back here well this one he's got running over the mag end 
uh, traditionally they they go the, out the back uh, and around the engine this way and for whatever reason he's run it backwards uh, probably because of the radiators mounting back here on the gearbox but anyway this has a hose goes on it one inch hose comes up here turns down and goes into the front part of the water pump impeller. This is simply a recirculation circuit, which means there's a thermostat in here. When that thermostat is closed, the water that's in the engine just doesn't sit there stagnant. It comes up here because when that thermostat closes, that opens this little surface back in here to allow water to come into your recirculating feature. Okay? Uh, and that's what it does. It just recirculates it, and then it comes up through your engine, and it, then it sends it around to the water pump, and then it comes up through your engine. It doesn't make as many hot pockets in your, in your chamber here as the older system did because the water just sat there stagnant until the thermostat opened and allowed a flow. Uh, uh, that and the ceramic water pump seal that we'll get to later are the two big improvements on the 582 Bluehead. Uh, the recirculation feature and the ceramic water pump seal are, were the big changes. Uh, you know the head obviously has changed so you so you have to get a new head uh, the only thing you would have to do to convert a gray head over to a blue head and and it literally be a blue head is to get another head get this this outlet on mine only L's one direction where you need one that goes two directions so you'd have to get that water water pump cover. Uh, you'd have to have the heads with the elbows and the thermostat. Uh, and uh, then have the old case machined to accept the ceramic water pump seal. And you can literally turn an old gray head into a blue head. Uh, that's the only difference in them. Uh, uh, the problem is this head is about $700, and that doesn't include the fittings. Okay, the next thing we want to do here, though, is check our rotary valve timing. Uh, my cheapo dial indicator and spark plug adapter tool that I made. You screw it in till it bottoms out. You bring the piston up until it doesn't go any higher. At top dead center, which is where that's at, either direction it starts going down. This should be lined up with this tab up here and should be slightly below that valve opening. In fact, they make markings. They make that one marking in it. But it's, it's punched into here so that if you flip the plate over, it's not going to sit in the same place. You notice we were right on that mark. We're going to try to line it up on that mark here. Okay. That's past the mark. Back it up one tooth. is now before the mark. 
There's no way, and that hasn't moved. When you can't get it lined up on the mark, then you try to flip it over until you get the best fit. And of course, that's right on the mark. Just a little bit clearer there. One other difference I should mention is the radius of this curve on the earlier 582s and even on the old 532s they had a five millimeter radius so they they cut about that much off they had, they were pretty big radius up through there on both edge edges one other thing i want to mention to you while we're we're in this subject area while most 582s uh, are mounted with the plugs in the upward position. Uh, there are still some applications that use them plugs down. Uh, uh, my plane, for example, I've got a Quicksilver with the 582 mounted underneath uh, with a gearbox on it. Uh, when you mount this engine upside down, the blue heads already have the modification. See this small hole down here? This is how this normally sets. It's like so on the side of the engine there. If you mount it upside down, it mounts like so. Okay? And that they, what they found was fuel and gas was collecting down in all this compartment down in here. And if you were to suddenly make a bank turn, it could flood the engine with that extra gas spilling out into the rotary valve, which is a very thin area, and it would all get sucked into the engine and run real rich and kind of flood it out. So what they've done is, and there's a, an, not an AD, but uh, a service bulletin out, uh, where if you have the old gray head model, uh, you need to verify that that hole's in there, and if it's not, you need to drill it. Okay, uh, now, and you, want, you would want to take this apart to drill that where you could clean all your dregs and, and pieces of aluminum out and, you know, make sure nothing's left in there. Uh, but I thought it's worth mentioning. Uh, again, that is only for an engine whose uh, application is going to be to run up, run with the plugs pointed down. Okay. The main reason that we 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 uh, pull this off before we pull the cylinder down, well, number one, we had to to pull the electronic plate to get the head off, but number two is the fact that the head must be bolted securely into place to use your dial indicator to get top dead center. So again, that's the reason that we did it before the head. It is perfectly acceptable to use an air ratchet to disassemble these engines, but it's not to reassemble. These are already loose. One thing you're going to notice when we pull this head off is that this doesn't use any gaskets. Uh, the only, well, there's a couple of gaskets, but the main gasket that goes in a 582 is the base gasket. You can see it sticking out right here. There's also a gasket for your water pump outlet and, uh, of course, gaskets for your, your water, well, for this one anyway. Uh, but other than that, most of these are O-rings, or what I call rubber bands, because that's kind of what they look like. Okay, and uh, at this point we've gotten all the bolts out. Uh, I did want to stop for just a minute to point out something. 
if you look, you see that they've used high temperature RTV uh, to try to seal up these bolts. These bolts are actually made with a lip. Anytime you have the the bolt with with the washer made onto it, the application calls for grease underneath the bolt. And if you can look at that closely, you'll see that it actually has a ridge going around it about here. That's the lowest point on that washer. And the reason I mention that, you can kind of see it there, is that what that's what mates to the head. You'll see around these holes in a minute when I hold this up that there's kind of a circular pattern around that. You put grease underneath here, lithium grease, clamp those down tight and they should not leak. When you start adding these fixtures where they don't have that lip on them, you have to start adding more than grease and that's what they've done here is they've used RTV to semi plug the hole and also put it under the cap to stop it from leaking. Along with that, you have to put it underneath here because it could leak between those surfaces. You know, water's, water pressure is going to be pushing up there and anywhere it can ooze out, it's going to. This, this bracket over here, I don't think I told you what it was for. The bracket that stood up so tall here was again the top bracket for these radiators that, that mount to each side back here. This bracket here was the oil injection tank. The tank was removed, but that was the metal bracket that, that the tank attached to. Uh, it has to be above your, uh, your inlet, which would have been right here, uh, for the oil injector pump. And there are several different ways you can mount it. Uh, that was the most appropriate. And now, as you see, our head's loose. I want to tilt this down just and, and pull a couple of bolts that... See that ring around there? That is caused from that surface I was talking about underneath the head. And lithium grease underneath that head, torque to the right torque specs, that shouldn't leak. If it does, you simply take them out one at a time, put just a little RTV under there, screw it back down, you know, tighten it up to the proper torque, and uh, that's an acceptable repair. Uh, Normally grease is enough. I wouldn't just go with RTV to be going with it. Uh, lithium grease is just a white grease. Uh, is normally good enough. Uh, I wouldn't put RTV on it until you've torqued it down properly and it's still leaking. Then I would take it out and use the RTV. Uh, and you take it one at a time and that will minimize how much your head leaks. Oh. And we'll look at the combustion chamber side of this. Uh, it's a very clean engine, has virtually no carbon buildup. It was said to have 60 hours on it. You can see where you can see right there. That was that's the O-ring. Uh, that keeps the water from coming in the cylinder and seals the cylinder up. Okay, there's another what I call a rubber band that goes around here that seals the outside so that the water can go into the cylinder but not, a, not leak outside the engine. Now, can you notice anything here? You can't see it yet. I'll bring it. 
to where you can see it. That rubber either got so hot it melted or they over torqued it and that actually got between the, the two metal surfaces. How that spread out, that's not normal. That's very abnormal. Uh, pull the other one out. Now see, it, it doesn't have any of those markings. It just looks like a standard rubber band. There's a little water there. A thick rubber band, but standard rubber band. No abnormal fraying like that one has. Uh, and here are the inner rings. They are just O-rings that are a metric diameter, uh, a certain thickness. When these, these are almost melted in there, this engine, I believe, has been hot. We won't know till we mic the cylinders, but the way all this, this, this doesn't normally stick in there like that. Uh, again, it's a, it, after three years, your seals are shot. Uh, this is a five-year-old engine so far. Uh, one thing we can tell about this engine is he's been using avgas, aviation gasoline. It's been stored at a, at a, for the last couple of years at a airport, and I guess he's been buying the gas there. If you burn avgas, you'll, you'll get either a yellow or a whitish coating. This one's more yellow. where they've used it for long periods, you can see how yellow this is. This is avgas. Uh, it's just a deposit of lead uh, because it is, it's not an unleaded gas, it's a low leaded gas. Remember I talked about one side of the cylinder was open into the water jacket and one side had just pockets. Okay, I want to show you that now if we can get it turned right. Let me get my flashlight. It's help easier to help you see. That's metal down in the bottom there. That's metal down in the bottom there. This is a drain. See the black holes? Those are the drains into the water pump side of the crankcase, which is the only place water goes down there. These are actually plugged up. So they will hold water and if you're not careful that all the water is removed after you take those four bolts out and start pulling the cylinder up, that water can go down into your crankcase. If that happens, uh, your crankshaft has a good chance that it's going to rust. So you don't want that to happen. And in an effort for it not to happen, what I'm going to do now is I am simply going to turn the engine over, tip the motor over, and see all that water come out? It don't look like a lot. But if that should go in on an unprotected crankshaft, uh, it could rust it fairly, fairly uh, liberally. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to pull the electronics out of here. Uh, this has a rubber grommet with a gap around it that fits around all these wires and just presses into place. And all you have to do is put a screwdriver under it, pull it out, and it has a split 
open the split up and just take it off the wires. Hang this end of the engine over the bench a little because we're going to use a tool that's going to rest down in here. Our flywheel puller tool. It won't fit anyway except to go down through there. Then we have to line our bolt holes up. Which I'm turning the flywheel. The thing that I like about this flywheel puller is it does a positive lock instead of trying to use a pin or rope, you know, to keep your piston from coming up. easier to do. I'm doing there is just removing the lock nut. You want to thread that in all the way, take advantage of all the threads that we've got. Screw that in all the way. So we're just going to use our breaker bar. Again, we don't care anything about torque. loose didn't fly out in the floor these newer ones have better magnets in them where they don't fly out of the floor as much uh, I'm kind of look around inside there look on this edge see if you see any oil that that may have come out of the front seal slipped underneath there and worked its way out and slung off in the past they have had some trouble with these solder joints just poorly being poorly soldered okay I don't see any problem there they have also had a problem with these flat plates coming loose so I'm checking them okay the stator and stator plate which is this this piece behind it uh, come are held on with just these two allen screws it takes four millimeter Allen wrench to get them out. And these have really been tightened. Okay. You pull it straight out, working your wires into the holes here. You just want to feed them through one at a time one socket at a time and there is our stator assembly removed if you look in here you will see some grease which guess where it came from right in that's your front seal and if you look at that black right down there that is where it started to flow down. So we do have a leaky front seal. It's just not as bad as the rear seal was. It would eventually start flowing down and, you know, like I say, build up around this hole, be flung all around here by the flywheel. I wanna always wipe that off first. The next thing we're gonna do is just remove the pickup coils these coils tell it when to fire. They send a charge up to the black box that says, let me get the flywheel again. It should fire and it does it by having these, these are just hunks of steel. As they approach the leading edge and travel past it, this is a magnet in here they will generate a small voltage that travels up that coil to the black box and will trigger it and say fire okay you have one on one side for one of your ignition systems 
you have one on the other for your redundant ignition systems. These will be timed when we put them back together, although the timing is nowhere near as critical as it was with the points engine. These are the newer style pickups, which simply means they can be adjusted vertically up and down as well as in and out, which is your air gap. You want a certain air gap in between this and this as it goes by. If it were to get too close, it could wipe out your pickup coil. This coil here, if it were to hit it, it would certainly wipe that out. Okay, at this point we're going to go ahead and we're going to uh, pull the water pump cover. The reason is, is once we go past this stage, we have no way to fixate the crankcase or the cross shaft to get the nut off of it. Right now we can still put the pin over here in the pulse port and, and lock the crankshaft, which will lock the cross shaft. Okay, and we're just about to pull the last one off, last bolt out. And then again, get our rubber hammer. We're just going to pop it loose from the gasket there. If you see remnants of the gasket do stay on, just coloring. Uh, we will bead blast all this to get all the gasket material off. But this white stuff is either minerals that was in the water or corrosion that built up. Uh, Another way to tell if the guy has been using the proper antifreeze is if you look inside here and notice the bolts, if you can see them, look up at this one. Okay, it's all corroded. Okay. Uh, that normally doesn't happen with this silicate, oxi silicate phosphate free antifreeze. They stay nice and bright and anodized. We're just going to pull the bolts that hold the cylinders down. And then as soon as we pull those, we will be removing the cylinders. Again, that's that bolt that was so messed up. That's all. Looks to me like a uh, lime. It's attached down here to the gasket. We're just trying to break it loose. And lift it out carefully. Okay, we're going to do the same thing to the other ones. Gasket's trying to stick to it. Very gently, want to pull it out. We don't want to let that fall against the side. This has a mated surface up under here that if you let the the that bang into there it will raise a little lip and can cause a base gasket seal a base seal leak and as i'm going i usually get rid of the gaskets while we're here i'm checking the rings and if you notice all this dark color below the rings that is blow by or the beginnings of blow by and what I am seeing here is that this ring, while the lower ring, while this side is fairly free, see it move? This side over here is pretty well stuck. It'll move slightly, but it's gummy. It doesn't want to readily pop out of there, where the other side will just pop out right now. 
So the rings were just starting to stick. This one's loose. So it was just starting to stick. We want to take one piston and put it at top dead center. Get the other piston at bottom dead center and out of our way while we pull the circlips. At this point I like to take something I can grab it with because we're not going to reuse that and just pull it out. Yeah. And if you see, there's a little hook on one end. That little hook is to keep it from rotating in the ring that it's in. The old ones theoretically could rotate around. Okay, This one can't because of that little, little hook on there. We're going to use the, the newer uh, wrist pin puller on this engine. Uh, we didn't use it on the 503 because it had caged bearings. You cannot use this on caged bearings. But you can use it on cageless bearings. You put it in. You screw it in. Oh, it's backing it out. Until we can get that on there and the cap screwed on all the way. Now that cap has a washer here that will allow this to set still while you're cranking the, p the pin out without unscrewing that cap. till it's centered in the bearing and then you screw it back the other way to take that cap off. Okay. Now I take this off. The wrist pin is still partially in the piston. And that just held all that together. Okay? And there's your piston. There's some of the discoloration from heat. There's some carbon underneath the piston. If these pistons still fit, of course, they will be decarbed before we put it all back together. And Getting back to this, that spring that's inside there is holding the whole set together. It gives you two of these with the puller because all you do is set that over the end and push the bearings into it. That, technically, every bearing is exactly where it was before. You haven't swapped ends with any bearings. You haven't gotten them out of order. Uh, this is just like they were in here since new. Okay. And all we're going to do now is rotate the engine 180 degrees to bring the other piston up to top dead center. Put it through there needs to go ought to be about right yep and then we just start yeah start retracting it
and we're just going to leave that hanging down that that away while we break all of our nuts loose and again you should start from the ends and work your way in uh, there's also some here on the outside again it's outside working your way in so you'll kind of see me work in a circular pattern towards the center we're going to start with these two there's one on each side Right, we've got them all loosened. Okay, I've got all of the all of these loose. Uh, at this stage, if you remember, we talked about the mated surfaces. Well, this is certainly a mated surface right there. And if you notice, your case splits right in the middle of this rotary valve system. But we want to find places like here where we won't go into the mated surface. We have a, a, a place that's big enough to put our screwdriver and pull the engine apart. Okay, good. The crankshaft stayed in the top half. So all we're going to do here take the bottom half of the case out and look how dirty the center section see all the the little bits of grit down in there this oil has never been changed uh, it does have a weep hole over here this is all just pretty much dirt this will all pretty much clean off. This right here is bearing spinach. It's where a bearing has spun. And if it's so much that you can feel it, you can hook it with your nail, you need to bolt the crankcase back together and put a dial bore gauge in here and uh, and and mic each one of these openings. Generally speaking, the case looks in reasonably good shape. Uh, I see somewhere where areas, but again, I don't really feel any kind of lip. And we're going to take a few minutes here and talk about this center section because right now is about the only time that you're really going to get a, a reasonable look at it. If you notice there is a seal on this end, this side, and a seal on this side that fits actually into a, a little groove that's, that's cut all the way around that crankcase. That is an oil seal because again remember the center section is full of oil uh, that's to keep the oil from leaking into the crankcase area and just getting burned up uh, you need it to stay in here to lubricate these gears there's bearings in here and in here uh, it's lubricating all that stuff as you turn the crankshaft it turns the rotary that the cross shaft which turns on this side the rotary valve and on this side the water pump impeller. What I'm doing here is putting the pin up through the pulse port and simply holding it in place. And all I'm trying to do here is take this nut off. Because once you take the crankshaft out, the whole, whole shaft will spin. You have nothing to stop it. Whenever you take this nut off, it gets replaced. And it simply gets pried out with a small screwdriver, working gently. If you pop that 
washer off of there, which is normally Loctited on there Comes off a little bit easier Again, this has some kind of corrosion on it Okay, that's off And here's your backing plate which has a flat key to match the flat part on there which and it's serrated where it will actually with tightness eat into the nylon and cause a positive lock which means it's going to turn there's also behind there a spacer washer that it's very important that you don't lose that when you go to reinstall the water pump seal if you don't if you forget and don't put that on there the seal can leak this is the ceramic water pump seal right here that you're seeing this is the cross shaft and it just simply presses out through the side there is a locking uh, snap ring on this side that we have to remove before we take it out once you push the cross shaft out of that seal that seal is no longer good because right now it is sealed to this front part by a magnet uh, by a metal to metal fit with a sealant uh, material on the inside of the hole. Uh, uh, once you pull this, you're replacing it. Are we going to pull it or not? What I'm going to do here is simply get my rubber hammer again. Just one tap gently and see when it starts to lift. Mm -hmm. You don't want to keep pulling up because that's putting these bearings in a bind. You just want to kind of wiggle back and forth. Now, as you notice me taking this out, I also want you to focus on how those inner seals actually fit into a groove. Okay. The sealing surface is right here underneath these little spring rubber bands. Those rubber bands help hold it tight against the crankshaft. But that's where it's sealing. Simply take this out. We have cleaned this counter off. And in here, this is this is abuse. See all this crap? I think that's water. When you go to put one of these back together, be it a new crank or reinstalling it with the old crank, these seals have a little bit that they'll move. And right there you can see the wear. If you look down this side, you can see that shiny ring around there. And that's where the seal has been rubbing. Uh, you could take a small screwdriver or something, go in there and see if it's a lip. Uh, most of the time it's like here it's really just where it's starting to polish it a little yeah i feel my lip back here so there's no reason to believe there's one up there that's just where the rubber has polished it off and whenever you want to test these bearings you want to pull the seals away from them so that they'll turn freely with the seals back against them they don't spin freely When you spin them, you're really listening for clicking noises. It was attached down at the other end, but it did come out. Uh, and that's all that holds the shaft in here besides the impeller on the other side. 
which we have to I just put those parts on there to keep from losing them but at this stage what we're going to do is we're actually going to remove this cross shaft now once we remove the cross shaft the water pump seal well all the seals in it are no longer reusable they must be replaced now if you notice when I turn this this inside piece of the seal is going to turn with the shaft that's because it's a press fit onto that shaft therefore once you remove it it will no longer seal again properly here's the tool to remove it it's actually made to be used on a press if you can notice I've hit it with a hammer before uh, it doesn't work as well that way okay and we simply put it in our press you want to be very careful that you're you've got it flat you want to be careful that these ears don't get broke off which most of our load is going on this block back here and this thing comes out relatively easy once you break it free when it first starts to move it kind of pops and you'll hear some groaning noises as we press it on out uh, but that's just uh, the the steel bearings rubbing across the met aluminum surface here it pop now if you notice the seal got depressed there And there is your cross shaft. Very, very dirty, but there it is. Uh, this is what drives your rotary valve, and it also drives uh, your oil injection pump. This side here drives the water pump this bearing here stays on the shaft you have to pull it off the shaft the other one stays in the block if you look through to the other side you'll see that there's a bearing in there it's held in with a snap ring it is removable uh, it's pretty much form fit so to get it out you kinda have to heat the case up and get the case to expand away from the steel ball bearing and then it will fall out. I do want to talk about on these crankshafts especially on your 582's is these seals right here when they actually start leaking this is what you're gonna see this little bottle that has your reservoir oil uh, is gonna start losing oil it will start disappearing but you won't see it coming out anywhere it'll just start going away you have to constantly refill that bottle when that happens your seals here are leaking either one or both are leaking allowing the oil to go out into this crankcase area or out into this crankcase area how do we know how old an engine is? Now the castings uh, have different marks on them uh, that tell you when the castings were made but the very last thing they make before they assemble these engines is the crankshaft. So if you look at the date on the crankshaft and it is usually on one of these plugs 
you will see that this crankshaft was made in 01. Can you make that out? Okay. So this is a 2001 crankshaft. Uh, it's now 2005. Uh, they usually have a month stamp on there too. The way you can tell the new crankshafts from the old crankshafts is the older crankshafts had a smaller pin that went through there and it didn't have this area machined off as this one does. What would happen when the early ones would fail is they had, you know, another eighth of an inch of metal around here. Just enough so that when it came around, it could smack into here. It could smack into the side of here. Uh, it could smack into the bottom of the case, uh, whatever. And it would break the crankcase. They machined that off just to give it enough clearance to where even when the bearings are completely missing, that won't hit the wall. Okay? Uh, this is all you're going to find now. Uh, the very early uh, silver heads, and I'm talking about the 90, 91, 92 years probably, uh, you may find the older crankshafts. Uh, they don't make this rod for any other application. And since we don't rebuild crankshafts, the aftermarket guys can't even get these rods because they just don't make that part. The part is made for a new crankshaft only. It's not a replacement part. It's not used in any other application, therefore the aftermarket guys can't get them. Uh, that's a very good shot of the bearing pins. I see no sign of rust. Again, this crankshaft we would put on V-blocks over here. We would put a dial, we would mount the V-blocks under this bearing here or in this bearing back here and we would measure it at the end on top of this bearing on top of this bearing and just shy of the of the uh, lock uh, keyway just shy of the keyway there and you would rotate it with with dial indicators on here and the most it's allowed to be out on a new crank is two thousandths in any one position. Uh, on a used crank, a, one that's come out of an engine, the maximum wear limit is three thousandths. If it exceeds that, you replace the crank. Your piston to cylinder wall clearance is critical. Okay. Uh, the 582, for example, has a maximum allowable clearance of six thousandths. That's the wear limit. Uh, but a new one's only three. When you put in brand new, you, you must have uh, right at three thousandths clearance just to allow for expansion so it doesn't seize up on a new engine. In order to get these tight tolerances, you must have the right tools. Two of those tools I'm going to show you here. They don't leave my hands. They are not loaner tools. Don't ever ask me to borrow them. This is your micrometer. What you do is you mic your piston. You get your maximum diameter on your piston. Wherever that is, then you lock it. You also would use this dial indicator when you bolt your crankcase halves together to get the, the diameter of these journals, you know, if you suspect wear. Real quickly now, we're going to show you how we check for the straightness of a crankshaft. Uh, 
I have two dial indicators. One, we're going to measure this, like I say, out on both ends, and then we're going to measure it in here on these bearings. And all we're looking for is how much out of, ideally, the number should read zero. Okay, that means everything's absolutely straight. It's not moving up and down. Uh, that very rarely happens, but what we're going to do here is go ahead and get what readings we can. All I want to do is set this dial indicator up on the top of that bearing, and I can't see it from, from where it is, but uh, you're going to be able to see. Well, I need to look around there. That's right on 40. So we go around, it moves slightly. That's less than a thousandth. So that's almost straight. And we're just inside the key, white, that key. So, that's, ooh, that meant two thousandths, just a hair over two thousandths, still within new tolerances, two thousandths is max for new, so the mag end is off two thousandths, the centers are virtually straight, and the PTO end is off one thousandths. Again, all of that is within new specs. Uh, so the crankshaft hasn't bent, uh, which is a good indicator. When you, when you start seeing the crankshaft get way off, it's a pretty good indication that your case is getting way off. 